Hello, everyone. Oh, wow, this is loud. I'm so sorry about that. Um, you can imagine I'm so fun on Zoom when I've had a few drinks. Okay, so, um, okay. So, my name is Makiko. I'm head of MLOps for a startup called Feature Form. Uh, we're an open source uh, virtual feature store or just an open source feature store. Uh, so, we're in the MLOps space. Uh, before I joined Feature Form uh, last year, uh, I was working on the machine learning platform team over at MailChimp. Before and after they were acquired right into it, that was fun. Enterprise changeovers, always like great story, right? Um, and then prior to that, worked as an ML engineer, data scientist, data analyst for companies like uh, Teladoc in the middle of the pandemic, trying to start my own real estate tech startup, also in the middle of the pandemic. As you can see, a sequence of brilliant choices throughout my career. Um, working at Autodesk as a data scientist, um, a number of other companies, Sunrun, you name it, like really random ones. Um, but anyway, so, you know, I have experience in the MLOps data science space. Um, and thank you so much, Anna, for uh, inviting me to come host. Uh, so we're going to go um, left to right. And actually, I might encourage all the speakers to um, introduce themselves. Uh, start with name, uh, title, company your experience and uh, a fun fact about you because we have to do that nowadays. Um, so we'll start on left with uh, Swagana. Hi. Um, yeah. Hi everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here and uh, letting us share our journeys and our thoughts on this really good emerging space called MLOps. So um, I, I am a data scientist with a company called Boomi. So for those of you who are not familiar with Bumi, uh, we are an iPaaS leader. And iPaaS is basically a platform where you can connect or integrate your apps and data together. And we provide a tool which is called Atomsphere, where you can just drag and drop. And using a no-code platform, you can connect your applications and data together with ease. Um, I have around seven years of experience in data science, um, originally from India. And I came to U.S. for my master's from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, that was the first time I was introduced to the concept of MLOps. Um, honestly, I actually started implementing MLOps by getting frustrated, by not having the right solutions and having a lot of failed machine learning models or not having the models fitting into production level. Uh, or spending years in just EOCs and research, I finally figured out that this solution needs more exploration, needs something more standardized. So that's when I started figuring out and came up with my own solutions and started proposing to different companies that I worked throughout. So with all of these failures, setbacks, and experiences in my current role at Boomi, we partnered with AWS and we built a MLOps ecosystem where we are able to see phenomenal growth in terms of so time in section to getting the models at production level. So statistically, initially we used to take like more than 12 months or 15 months just to get a model from conception to production level. But why we integrated with AWS and users used the MLOps ecosystem, <clears throat> we've been able to get models, several models in a matter of like three to four months. So more tips and advice as we walk through in panel discussion. So stay tuned. Thank you. Uh, Matt Dober, I lead actuarial and data science for Marsh. Marsh is a commercial insurance broker. Uh, we're, the, we're the largest in the world. We help our clients understand their risk, understand the ways to handle that risk, whether that's retaining it on their own balance sheet, going out and buying insurance, trying to mitigate the risk. Um, we'll help them through that process of finding the right insurance, thinking through their risk uh, uh, analytically, and uh, and do other risk consulting kind of engagements to 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 help them deal with that. Uh, my background is as a as an actuary. Uh, I've got about twenty years in the insurance industry, most of that in reinsurance pricing. Uh, actuaries are are sort of the original data scientists, uh, so it was kind of a natural move over to the uh, the data science field for me. Uh, and now we're really helping Arsh build out more scale rules, uh, more, more of a, the analytics that, that sit behind our platform. So this can take the, 
the mode of rating engines where we think about the frequency and severity of loss, uh, as well as exposure analytics. So we do a lot with natural language processing, understanding what people are saying about our clients and what our clients are saying uh, publicly. Uh, we look at things like street view uh, level, street level imagery from, from like Google Street View. Uh, to understand things about buildings. So so maybe that's the, the height of the building or something about its construction. Um, and any of that kind of better understanding of the risk now sits behind our platforms. A lot of AI and ML events happen there. Then the last thing I'll mention is uh, claims predictions where we sort of identify which claims are, are riskiest, which ones might develop at first leave, aka becoming much larger than we might have thought, who needs more medical intervention or which claims might go up to litigation. Uh, so we help um, identify that using using a die and ML tool. My, my fun fact, which I've been taken up, is that for a month, I ate nothing but potatoes. Do you want Wilson Globe for then? Thank you. Thank you all. Now, of course, we have to at some point you're going to have to clarify was it like different kinds of potatoes or was it just like a single style of preparation for a potato and any kind of potato um eat potatoes very controversial that from the curve bank tweens do they have to count they totally count but they're 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 they count in the bid section I uh, to me they were too tasty like they just didn't they like that's a good problem they had yeah thank you Hi everyone, my name is Ravi, Ravi, uh, Ravi Shankar, lastly Vallabha Yoshida. So I lead data science uh, at Ipitas, so essentially we the team of... Uh, so we, we are actually doing a lot of interesting work and uh, especially with Marsh and many other customers. So really appreciate the time uh, that uh, all the speakers have taken today to kind of come here and talk about various things, especially MLOps. And this is an area we are doing a lot of interesting work. Um, so prior to uh, Impetus, I've been in Impetus now coming up on nine years, so it's been a long journey doing lots of things and uh, started as a data scientist in Impetus and kind of grew into this role. But uh, by training, I'm actually an engineer. Uh, got my master's and uh, PhD from Rice University in, uh, interestingly enough, stochastic mechanics just apply to kind of various uh, things where you have uh, various things changing probability distributions and so forth. Kind of applied that to many other areas, including, uh, uh, you know, uh, computational biology and uh, uh, predicting genes and stuff like that, which I got into because of uh, Human Genome Project was really generating a lot of data at that time. Uh, after that, worked in computational biology and kind of migrated into data science through that area. So that's how I kind of uh, came to this. And the fun fact I would like to share is uh, it's good to have a mic in my hand if I'm not allowed to do that at home. <laughs> I'm a pretty bad singer. <laughs> so, that's it. <laughs> but I promise I won't sing here. Right, you need to want that. Yeah, I'm with you. I'll stick with I think um, fun fact is that I have swag in my name. <laughs> That's not a fun fact. That's a drip. That's a drip fact, my friend. Absolutely. Uh, my fun fact is, uh, if I were not doing ML ops, I would have been a fashion designer, and it was really crazy because I I used uh, this was back when I was using ChatGPT at one point, right? And I was like, imagine a different biography. It was like write my biography. I wanted to see if my name got picked up in the training data. So, short story, it it didn't. I I'm not that popular or famous, but imagine this alternative history where I was a world-renowned fashion designer that had gone to the Tokyo Institute of Fashion and was celebrated for my infusion of Japanese and Western fashion. I was like, wow, that hurts right there. That would have been my alternative history. But uh, anyway, so, uh, but I do have actually a bunch of industrial machines at home because I do streetwear on the side. Occasionally I make TikToks about it. Uh, cool. Um, okay. So let's get started actually with the first question. Um, driving business innovation in AI and ML. What are some of the most interesting trends and challenges that are not Copilot or ChatGBT or MidJourney uh, that you see that truly drive like business innovation um, and maybe even business value? If I can take that question. 
which kind of this works. And I'm done with self development. So thank you, Mickey. That's an interesting question, right? So a lot of things happening, especially like you mentioned, chat GPT and other things. But besides that, there's the whole universe of uh, applications and uh, customers and you know people trying to do things with the data. Data is all over the place. We've been generating data for so long. And uh, uh, even small enterprises are sitting on data. They are really struggling how to make sense of it. Now they have some tools to do that, but still, Kind of, where do you bring the value in terms of uh, uh, innovating the data, changing the uh, data for them to kind of derive value and create new use cases, right? So they may be uh, delivering things to the customers, but they are doing things in a kind of more uh, reactive manner, let's say, because they are kind of reacting to what's required in the market and building use cases and uh, applying various things. But if they had some tools where they could actually bring all of the data sources, sources and enable them to kind of integrate that and see one holistic view of things. And typically, this is one area where a lot of enterprises are lacking because they are actually have um, in an area where they're kind of dealing with siloed data sets or, you know, they have teams not working together. There are a lot of pieces not integrated well. The MLOps kind of fits into this space where it kind of spans the entire spectrum from data management to kind of building and uh, creating value out of that data, cleaning it up, maintaining it, and then building models, productionizing it. So the best practices that you can bring to this and uh, various uh, uh, startups and organizations doing many things. And more recently, of course, uh, all of this uh, is being accelerated to the cloud, as you can imagine. And uh, for example, we are partners with AWS and Azure and and we see a lot of idea and customers either trying to migrate to crowd or even to kind of even do things on-prem, but build a lot of things uh, that they can, uh, you know, deploy using services. And this is where I think there's a lot of uh, new innovation happening. And uh, it better is kind of kind of enabling this for customers. And uh, I see this across sectors, not just any specific thing. I mean, uh, with Impetus, we work across customers in banking, finance, healthcare, manufacturing, uh, and, you know, lots of customers and you see a lot of trends in terms of how uh, data is becoming centered to business. Previously it was, you know, uh, kind of let's build something because there are a lot of customers needing this and there's an opening. Now they are sitting on historical data of maybe years worth of uh, data. They want to kind of derive new things out of it and I've heard even customers say, um, you know, where is my next uh, post-it? Like, uh, post-it note was a story about 3M. They've kind of built post-it as a uh, they didn't want. They didn't go trying to build post it as a product. It just happened serendipitously because you know they found a new application for it. And uh, third customer say, well, is, well, how do I do something new with my data that actually I'm not looking for, but you know you can kind of find. So there are a lot of things that people are trying to do in this space. You want to pick up on that because we're we're seeing that a lot in in our industry as well. So our, our clients really run the gamut, Fortune 500 companies down to small, single proprietor, or multi, you know, small, small businesses. Uh, increasingly, they want to make those decisions in, in that data-driven way. And that's really been accelerated by the amount of press that AI and ML has been getting o over time. But we really now need to be engaging them in an in analytic-driven way. Uh, we need to be bringing the data that, that we have front and center to them. I think we're we're often in a, in a place of helping them understand how to buy insurance, what the right pricing is, and and where to go for that. I think if if we were having this conversation ten or, or twenty years ago, that that function was really a part of procurement. It, it was very much a lowest cost uh, provider, um, and and more and more what we see is that that people really want to make data driven decisions. It's it's something where they want to understand how their risk changes. They're, they're really engaging with this in a much more sophisticated way. So, so they're thinking about upsides and downsides. What can I retain? What's the best use of my capital? All, all of this feeds into an AI and ML play because if, if you don't understand how, what's predictive of future risk, what, what can happen, uh, you, know, you really don't have the information to make those decisions. Uh, and, and so I think as we're putting out more AI, ML powered tools, we're scaling those out to more of our clients, they're seeing it more externally. It's it's really a nice virtuous cycle, and it feeds the the data cycle as well, which is which is a really important part of what we do. 
And I'm kind of curious. The thing that to me has also been really fascinating. I've worked in startups. I've tried to bootstrap my own. I've also worked in enterprises. And it's kind of curious the uh, diversification of innovation, shall we say? For example, it seems like most of the players that have come out in terms of new capabilities have either been enterprises where they're using it to supplement uh, a different core, you know, a, a, a business model that is not core to that innovation, but that innovation enables. But you also see a lot of startups and ones that are, I wouldn't say, you know, smaller or mid-size, where maybe their kind of claim to innovation is they can move fast. They're pretty agile, maybe because they're stacked, because of the team. Um, have you seen, have you seen this as well? And what would you say in terms of the types of innovations and like the types of companies or organizations that are best able to take advantage of those? Like, what are your what are your thoughts on those? Yeah, I mean, I. I a couple of things that that come to mind is as you're asking that question uh a lot of success at, at least in our space comes down to distribution um there there are often very good ideas from the startup space uh but they i think they they, they struggle to take those to product uh because it's not part of a, a a complete package of offerings that that clients need to to actually act on um so where we try to distinguish ourselves is is having the the ability to you know we have relationships with a lot of clients we have the platforms to host and and bring these tools to them uh, it it again kind of fits into the the cloud offerings that we have right if we can deploy quickly uh, that maybe shortens the the gap between the innovation that's happening at the startup uh, and the innovation that, that's happening at Marsh and and you know being completely candid we are not the fastest moving operator there we we're 80,000 people globally, uh, it is not easy to, to turn that battleship. Um, so what, what we try to win on is, is kind of a, a steady drumbeat of adding AI and ML tools, uh, keeping abreast of what's happening in the startup space, uh, finding, finding things that we think are, are going to be relevant and whether that's acquisition or, or, or building on our own, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to match a lot of that. So oh, speaking of what uh, Matt was speaking about, so there's a lot of uh, pieces of uh, you know, innovation happening even in large enterprises, but they tend to be kind of limited to certain groups and because they're kind of uh, pushing the envelope a little bit further. But uh, in general, kind of somebody who sets the ball rolling in terms of how do we kind of kind of discover new things and take more of these kind of uh, you know uh, innovations or products to the production side. Typically, a lot of the experiments they may be doing may not reach that level. And part of the reason is because they don't have that, uh, um, you know, pieces gelling together. And that's where we are able to kind of uh, figure out, and this is something we're trying with a lot of other uh, customers, um, you know, where uh, we have kind of enabled them to specifically dis discover something in the data that they didn't realize or kind of get something uh, as a... Uh, new capability that they can provide to their customers and uh, in general there is a, a tendency to kind of uh, chase the latest uh, sh shiny thing but in typically what happens is that lasts for a bit and then uh, the, the rest of the organization kind of uh, lags behind and uh, one of the piece that we try also to help customers do is kind of uh, bring training to the rest of the uh, organization because like large uh, organization like Marsh uh, like uh, Matt mentioned you know, kind of doing it step by step is very helpful. And sometimes uh, things change too fast for uh, a lot of these enterprises to keep up. So continuously enriching this through, uh, you know, uh, learning process is something also we find very helpful. So um, to answer your prior question on the emerging trends in AI ML, apart from the LLMs and GPT world, one thing that I've observed is this concept of explainable AI or XAI. So this is something which a lot of companies are trying to achieve where they want to treat AI no longer as something of a black box. They want to understand all these models and what happens behind those behind the scenes in a deeper level. So they want to understand, for example, if we take the AWS environment, there is something called as AWS Clarify, wherein you can see 
why which model worked what parameters worked what was the drift and why uh, certain features make more sense it gives in a very descriptive way that anybody uh, from business background anybody can understand and make use and give feedback rather than having this siloed data scientist or people in the data world only working and understanding the ai and explaining it to them so this emerging trend of xai or explainable ai is something that a lot of companies are trying to make it basically democratize uh, ai and make it accessible to businesses and other people who are interested and um apart from that another thing that i've seen um a latest trend is in edge computing so edge computing has been there for a very long time but recently when it comes to the ai ml space um what aws and other cloud giants are trying to achieve is okay we are giving this cloud platform and we are able to give you uh, you know best costs and best efficiency but how can we even make it more efficient that is using edge co edge computing so edge computing basically means that whatever data processing is happening that device is brought closer to um actual source of data so you no longer have any latency or bandwidth issue and for situations where you need real time data that edge computing in ai ml can efficiently solve that problem so i think edge computing and um, explainable ai i think are one of the emerging trends in ai ml i'm really i'm really glad you went that direction because something that to me was very interesting uh i know for me like i was not i don't have a formal education in computer science or data science or math or whatever i studied anthropology economics because you know what studying monkeys seemed a lot better than going to med school um you know dr larry engineer right that's the trinity of, of jobs uh one must achieve uh if they want to not get disowned by their family um so you know i self-taught went through a data science boot camp all that great stuff and uh and then i landed in a startup and then an enterprise and it was just astounding how different machine learning is in an enterprise setting versus a startup um besides the fact that a startup can do essentially whatever it wants and no one can say anything unless they can actually see into the internals of the startup um there are some things that are just quite different from not just trying to do data science ml but actually trying to build a platform or internal tools for like enterprises um so I could you actually um, tell us a little, because you talked about your sort of introduced your experience, especially around uh, SageMaker. Um, what are some other kind of insights and experiences you can share about uh, building like a data powered, like ML uh, platform in the enterprise space? Yeah. So um, to get started with, we partnered with AWS um, because they have been our partner since a very long time and we wanted to get into the space of cloud computing and how can we go from you know on premise to a cloud enabled company so while setting up our first model we looked at the entire eco space okay ml ops is not just just operationalizing but also it takes into account the prior steps that you did in your local setup like the data aggregation building the model the training so now you take all of that and put it in in a cloud environment and use that ecosystem So to start off with, we uh, started with uh, something called as SageMaker projects. So SageMaker projects is basically it gives you a template. So let's say you are not familiar with um, what are the different steps in my pipeline. So you can just take a pipe, take a template from SageMaker projects. So for example, if you want to just train and deploy the model, and you don't care about the model monitoring aspects. there is a template for that and all you need to do is just take that template change it with your data and make certain tweaks and you're and you're good to do good to go you don't need to worry about the scalability the security all of those aspects are taken care of and another issue that we used to observe was that okay in development environment we have github or like version control where we can collaborate with our team members but that was something missing in in data science and people used to just work in their siloed jupiter notebooks and just nobody knew what other person is working so then the uh, aws provided something called as sagemaker pipelines which basically once you use the sagemaker project to build your template initial template now you can use something called as pipeline wherein you can define each step let's say your training step and containerize it so what happens when you containerize every step in the process is that 
you don't have the problem of version controls or let's say you're using a PyTorch model and the version, the new version comes and your model is still using the prior version. Now the entire loop will crash because the version changed and there were some dependencies in the code. So the dockerization enables you to take care of that and SageMaker pipelines automatically take care of that for you. So using a combination of SageMaker projects, SageMaker pipeline, dockerizing everything, um, we didn't have to take care of the security and authentication or any of that headache that traditionally we have to do. And in terms of sharing and collaborating with the team, uh, because it was all in one environment, uh, SageMaker pipelines allows everybody in the team to create their own uh, username and account and whatever changes they make can be tracked. It's very similar to what you do in a GitHub push, pull, and all those commands. So everything was similar to what we do in a development environment, and all we needed to do was just create a template and just tweak, and we are good to go. So yeah. And uh, how does that how does that jive with y'all's experience about working enterprise uh, ML data platforms? So so I feel like I've repeated myself a little bit. Real big company. A Any time that we're trying to get uh, the right platforms and the right tooling, it's 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 a struggle. We're dealing with a lot of proprietary data. We're we're dealing with existing systems. We've made uh, contractual obligations to about how we will use data, about how we will protect data, uh, and so as as we try to move to things like the cloud, things like a, a big data lake, there's there's a lot of hurdles. There's there's a lot of internal stakeholders. There's there's a lot of um, again, contractual obligations that we have that, that won't allow us to do that. We, we work through it, uh, but it is slow. It's, it's, it's not that startup feel. Um, when we get going, it, it, it can really be powerful because we, we do have that data. We do have that distribution. So, so once we build something, it can, uh, it can immediately have a big impact. But, you know, I think back to, to times when we, we were building out our, our, our data lake and then, uh, spent a lot of effort to build it. And then, once we started to request access to it, that was a really big, really big uh, uh, rock to try to get up the hill. Um, we we spent a lot of time doing that. Eventually, did get access to all of the encrypted data in, in our prod system. So okay, now we have to go back and and, and try to work through that. Uh, we would have SageMaker enabled in in Dev and the data in Prod. We can put public data in Prod, but we can't take it off uh, even into our own system. So I, a lot of these things, you know, need to get worked out in the in the enterprise system. Um, so it's yeah, I do sometimes envy the uh, the this, the startup atmosphere you guys get to work in. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it's definitely an area for uh, you know different kind of enterprise to really shine because this enables uh, them to really build some interesting solutions and. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, push the null up and enable them their own customers to really benefit from their data, right? So, um, and Swagata, thanks for mentioning that uh, responsible AI because that's an area that's really something that we're looking into as a uh, thing to kind of uh, build further on. And we have customers, in fact, interested in things like uh, data governance, model governance, in fact, trying to do the whole thing about you know, uh, not just leave the model production but track it and kind of also be able to explain that to regulators and for that they need bias detection, kind of figure out how to rectify the bias if they can find. So if somebody is applied for one and is uh, rejected, they can provide an explanation and so forth. Um, and another idea that also that uh, occurs to me is, uh, and this is something in the context of MLOps is, uh, you know, security, right? Security is central to a lot of things, data, security, privacy, all these things are really relevant to uh, in today, today's world especially. And uh, I'm not even talking about cybersecurity. That's a whole different area. But uh, enabling security in terms of today, uh, there's also adversarial way of defeating models because models can be trained with uh, data that kind of looks like original data, but uh, you know you can actually get the wrong kind of results, and that uh, pushes you know the enterprise to be able to kind of face different kind of uh, um, you know scenarios where they may be taken to court. How do you prevent those kind of situations? So. A data platform that can handle all those things is pretty complex to build. So uh, the best way to do it is step by step, kind of take one piece at a time, kind of build it out and experiment and kind of 
uh, you know, layer it in terms of uh, printing the pop sitting. And I see some lot of enterprises doing that, and we, the project people doing that. Is Max seeing the AI three sixty pack in the building, it, um, and it's a learning experience. I mean, I learned a lot from this whole task with myself. Uh, so that's what happens. Yeah. So what's really funny is uh, guess the group that uh, is typically neglected when you are designing or building your ML platform, and yet they have the most power to block all your efforts all your efforts when it comes to AIML. I'll let you guys guess that group. It starts with an L, ends with an R, and rhymes with, like, Sawyer. So, yeah. So don't forget those people. Um, the number of requests we've gone where it's like, can we, can you design this so a non-technical person can use this? It's like, who's a non-technical person? Our lawyers who are going to sign off on the data that we'll be using as features for the ML models. Oh, sorry. Uh, what company are you? Uh... Well, we're more than 10,000 employees. Okay, you got it. You are you are getting that feature, my friend. Um, but no, seriously, uh, sometimes there is a certain, how should I put this, a lack of ML as a platform thinking, because by definition, when you think of a platform as a product, you are thinking of all your owners, all your key stakeholders, and a lot of times product and, lo product and legal tend to be the unsung heroes who are simultaneously sometimes frustrating to work with, but they're also preventing you and your company from getting sued for GDPR levels of money. Um, so yeah, that is a fantastic group. Um, so we started actually talking about MLOps practices because I would say security, huge neglected area. Um, and it's kind of fascinating. You, you're seeing this in sort of all different areas. You're seeing this in LMs and Gen AI. You're seeing this, we saw this in MLOps. There's almost this bimodal distribution of you have kind of the things that people and hackers do for fancy cool projects that look really flashy they trend on twitter um you know but then there's what companies actually need to be doing and how they actually do ml um and so i'm kind of curious if uh especially we'll start with uh swagata about adopting ml ops best practices especially in a cloud computing environment yeah um so i think uh, continuing on the last question and kind of merging this one, you talked about security. Uh, I think that is a neglected area. And for security, one of the latest trends I have been observing is federated learning, especially in the space of like healthcare or like finance where privacy is the most important issue. So federated learning basically means that your edge devices uh, basically distribute your data and in a way that the data is local and the model is shared. So instead of uh, in a typical cloud environment where the data can go anywhere in any of the systems, the data which is local stays in the local copy and it's the model which gets distributed. So the central uh, repository of the data will collect all the model results and aggregate it. So this way, whatever is local stays local and it also improves your model efficiency. So in terms of like healthcare and finance domain where this is very critical, like privacy is very critical, federated learning can solve that problem. Um, apart from that, uh, if it comes to like adopting best practices in ML, there's no one size fits all. So like you said, startups have different best practices, whereas uh, giant companies have different practices. But one of the key aspects is understanding um, your maturity level of uh, ML ops. So even though MLOps is still in its infancy, there are different levels of uh, maturity that each organization or enterprise has. Uh, to give you an example, there is a concept called uh, feature store, which is common in cloud environments. And um, it's, it's, it's a great feature. Like it, it basically means given your data, what are all the features that you have and you store it in a, in a place together and that's called feature store. But if I don't want to use that data set for multiple use cases, it, it doesn't make sense for me to have that feature store. So for smaller companies, it might not be a very important uh, practice, but for bigger companies that need to use that same data, having a feature store makes more sense and saves them a lot of time. So first step is to understand the level of maturity that you have and what kind of features will suit you. Um, second thing that uh, we talked about that MLOps is kind of similar to DevOps in the sense we do have CI, CD 
CICD means continuous integration and continuous delivery, but there are added layers to MLOps, which makes it more and more complex. So I would like to term it as CT and CM. So CT means continuous training and CM means continuous monitoring. So on top of CI, CD, we have CT and CM. So when you combine all of these continuous things together, it gets really complicated. So the, to enable best practices for all of these four continuous things together, a couple of things that we have adopted in our company and that has worked well for us is we focus a lot on the traditional DevOps things, They're like uh, you know, peer review and uh, enabling code quality checks, which is not typically done in a data science environment. So we make sure that we have that in place. We also use a, something called as AWS config, which tells the resource configuration. So if somebody in your team is working on a resource and then you work on it the next time and you don't know what change they made. So having something which has uh, a track of metadata with all the changes helps in making sure that uh, you know, all the resources have all the track changes so that you know what change you're making and that gets tracked to the next person. So these kind of practices we've copied from DevOps and uh, incorporated in our CI, CD, CM, CT platform. So um, these are some of the best practices that we have been able to incorporate and it has done wonders for us. Yeah, I'd love to pick up on that because there's... There's so much value actually in in the lawyers and in the systems that we set up with with folks at Impetus like like yourself, Copy, or or especially VJ. Uh, ha having those systems set up really does enable us in in a couple of ways to to blow out what we're doing in the AI and ML space. So so one, as you were saying, Swagata, uh, there are tools here for better uh, better development, CI/CD, CTCM. That's new to me, but I love it. Uh, and uh, code reviews, th those sorts of things are, are enabled by having the right systems in place. And it's not something uh, in the more traditional ways that, that we would have done things that that is at all possible. So, you know, it really unlocks that. And and then the other thing I'd, I'd say that it unlocks is the number of people who can start playing around with things. One, once you have that security set up, uh, it, it, re it actually enables even more people to, to start looking at this. I've always been skeptical of the of the citizen data scientist, but we have a lot of very analytic folks, either coders who who have a bit of a math background or or folks with a math background who do a little bit of coding, uh, very eager to learn this stuff, want to uh, want to get more involved in it. And and when you have the right systems in place, both from the governance side and and data access and control uh, and the and the right platforms for developing it, it can really have a lot. So uh, some very good points uh, that all of you raised, right? So, um, and uh, some things I've observed based on the best practices that people have uh, truly adopted uh, in this space, especially with the cloud, uh, are things to kind of enable them to automate a lot of things and kind of make sure that uh, without the best practices, obviously if you automate something, it's not repeatable, it may not work uh, the way it uh, should. And a simple example I can give you is like uh, digitizing your uh, uh, documents or whatever. So if you don't have a process to kind of, or a model to even kind of extract information and deliver it into the right data stores and kind of uh, create entities, tag them, each time you may end up with the wrong uh, results or kind of different results. So you have to ensure that all key practices that you apply are really stringent and meet the requirements to for that particular application. So it kind of leads us into kind of more like uh, business process automation or more now intelligent process automation as well. And uh, there are other areas also that uh, uh, I'm seeing some lot of in, interest in, for example, with uh, non-traditional uh, industries. For example, in oil and gas, uh, we have people kind of looking at uh, data sets that generating from SCADA data sets. And they previously, in fact, I worked, my first job was in oil and gas, uh, kind of building particular real-time models for pipeline flows. And interesting, that was all like siloed data sitting Today, it would not work. I mean, you have to look at the whole network of stuff. And the, we have customers kind of looking at all of the data sets integrating it, not just from the data point, but also to the end customers delivering different products they're building in automated fashion. Uh, 
uh, adopting different uh, practices that like with the Sogita and that shit. So I think there's a lot of things happening and uh, one direction that we're also seeing some uh, move towards is kind of, uh, you know, deriving benefit from uh, uh, kind of existing the models that there are, right? So you have uh, processes in any enterprise. Now, if you can describe the process adequately, you can kind of uh, create a structure around that process and kind of automate it. But it takes work to even document and automate all of that. So that's uh, an area still lacking a lot of innovation and protect could have then. And I actually feel like, um, and then like we, I've, I've done a few workshops and classes on this. Um, I honestly feel like, oddly enough, some of the best MLOps practices aren't even MLOps practices, but they're actually practices from product, from product management, from growth, from all the groups that sometimes us engineers and us data scientists, we feel like we're way too good to learn from, and yet on a regular basis, front end teams are measuring user engagement. They're measuring user adoption with like, you know, your, their mobile app or whatever, right? Um, your growth or a growth marketing team, they have a strategy for how to get users on board into your app. And yet a lot of times I see a lot of companies that claim like, oh yeah, we have this ML platform and it's like, right. But half your data scientists don't use it. So is it really like the platform that your like company actually has or is it just a collection of services or, you know, a clutch of tools that the team that actually, the team that has the title on the platform is actually supporting. So honestly, I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of times too, you know, so one thing that I think everyone can agree on, right, is there's no such thing as an MLOps expert. Like we're, the, the area is still too new for there to really be an MLOps expert. Right. And I think, um, so what does that mean? Well, one, that means there's immense room for growth and for development of MLOps and GEARS and MLOps best practices. There, there's still that room for growth, especially with a lot of the fun stuff that's been happening the last like four or six months. Uh, a lot of room for making sure stuff doesn't break horribly in ways that harm human society. Right. So, um, so there's that. Right. But more importantly, that also means that I think there is space for, you know, pulling together ideas, not just from DevOps, like DevOps is the most obvious, you know, place to look at and go like, let's pull practices there. But looking at things, for example, like, okay, well, how do you actually develop a platform that people like using and they just don't tiptoe around to go like, you know, shadow IT, a different containerization tool or a different monitoring tool or whatever, right? A lot of places where we can uh, learn and grow more at, more from. Um, cool. Well, uh, also, we started at a different time, so we can just keep talking uh, for a long time. Uh, yeah, so if, if anyone wants to do a time check, uh, just let me know. But um, with that being said, though, we're still not finished because we do have some amazing examples of specifically practitioners who have driven real value using AI and ML in their respective uh, teams, companies, orgs, you name it. Um, so... Uh, so I, gotta, I think you you talked quite a bit earlier um, about some really great best practices. Uh, Matt, did you? I think you 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 could dive in a little bit deeper about Marsh, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll I, I may have mentioned at least some of this, but but happy to talk about you know some some real world applications because they're now being used by a lot of our our internal colleagues and and external. Client. So, so maybe one to uh, to call out is our public directors and officers liability model. Uh, so, public companies when they file uh, their earnings reports or or otherwise make statements, uh, the investors in those companies are relying on the the risk disclosures, the accuracy of what those those directors and officers are saying uh, to make their investments and. What will often happen when a stock drops substantially in value, uh, the the shareholders of the company will have lost a lot of money. They will join a, a class action lawsuit and sue not just the company, but also the directors and officers personally uh, for their mismanagement or alleged mismanagement of the company. This is a, a huge risk for publicly traded companies. And again, because it is personally... Uh, these are these are lawsuits personally against the directors and officers. They are highly motivated 
to make sure that they have the right protection in place uh, in, in the event that one of these uh, occurs. We, we built an entire uh, tool here to, to help them understand that. So it's it's an XG boost model, which I'm guessing most people have, have at least played around with. Uh, so, so kind of a, a random forest ML style model uh, and it takes into account a lot of financials data. Uh, we have a version that now includes uh, environmental, social, and governance scores, uh, as well as uh, natural language processing from the regulatory filings to understand the risk of a loss, what, what's the likelihood in any given year based on your financials, based on these other factors, uh, the chance of having a loss. And then when that loss goes to uh, goes to suit, whether it's likely to be settled or dismissed, maybe about half the claims are, are very quickly dismissed. There was no actual, or the, or the court finds that there was not uh, there was there was not the level of malfeasance or or, or mismanagement that would uh, that would justify uh, an award, um, and then with those half that that do become settlements, how big they can be, and so we have models that that predict each of these. It's been hugely effective for our financial and professional lines folks when they're talking at the C suite level. These are the people who are on the hook uh, if they don't have the right coverage, so they're quite interested in it, uh, and and. The results of these models are are going in front of all of our publicly traded clients. You know, again, we have a pretty substantial share of those, and and now growing as a as a result of of this model. So that's been a nice that's been a nice win. And then maybe the other one that I'll mention um, is on the property side because there's there's a number of tools there that I I think are are really interesting and probably a, a lot of runway uh, for that. I, I I often I often say that. Uh, the, the risk rating piece is something that actuaries have been doing for 100 years, 150 years. It's a, it's a very well picked over area. In some sense, it makes sense for data science because you have a you you have data, you have years and years of historical data. You have a very obvious target, uh, but because of that reason, there are there are already pretty good models. Where there aren't models are are things like uh, understanding property portfolios. Um, you, you can think in a in a hurricane or an earthquake, uh, the height of a building is can be surprisingly impactful on the on the ultimate loss from them. So, so yeah, w wind varies uh, with height off the ground. So, the taller the building, the higher the winds that it might be exposed to. Uh, in an earthquake, there's there's actually an interesting phenomenon where uh, certain fault lines have resonant frequencies, and so when that shaking begins, if it matches the resonant frequency of the building that's that's on top of it, you you can get an amplifying effect, and 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 those buildings sustain substantially more damage. You you can look up pictures. Uh, there was an earthquake in Mexico City, I want to say in the seventies, uh, where it it sort of resonated with the six story buildings, and so you'll you'll see two three story buildings with very little damage, 10, 20 story buildings with very little damage, and kind of everything in that middle piece completely flattened uh, because that that's where it where it hit. So we, we build out a lot of models that, that kind of help our clients understand the property exposures. Height is just one of those. Construction of the building, whether it has sprinklers, whether it has solar panels on the roof, all of these things feed into damage during an event like this. Uh, and so we have a number of tools. Again, I, I mentioned some of the computer vision stuff that we're doing, which is looking at street level imagery, finding the building, using some trigonometry to understand the height of it. Uh, you know, we've train like convolutional neural nets to understand the construction, or at least what you can tell about the construction of a building from its facade. Uh, we have a uh, an auto encoder decoder kind of architecture, if folks are familiar with that, to understand anomalies in our property portfolio. Uh, so what what we find is that there's a lot of errors in the data that our, our clients provide, and, and we want to at least alert them to that. There are certain combinations of attributes that are very unlikely to uh, to to occur together. So for example, we had a a 14-story uh, wood frame building in Florida that is, you know, in in some sense quite plausible, right? You 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 can build 14-story buildings that way, but you would never build one in Florida because it's it's that would be insane. So it it was actually a reinforced concrete building that is a substantially more resilient uh, construction in a hurricane, uh, and so our, our our modeling picks that out. And what what we're finding, 
I, there's there's kind of two impacts, right? So the the impact to our client is that they now have better data when they go and they buy uh, property insurance. They're getting a better, they have a better understanding of the risk. They they are making sure that they are buying the right coverage, uh, and the carriers have more comfort in the data that they're basing their decision on, which leads to one to more accurate pricing and 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 two usually to lower pricing. If you have low data quality, that's a risk that they have to now take on to their books, and so they're going to charge for that for that risk. Uh, and and then the other thing is our clients like this it's it's we build when when we're building these platforms the ai ml comes along with uh other use cases so so now they have a place to store this information they don't have to redo it every year it isn't uh, emailed pdfs and and excel sheets right you know we can we can house that data which uh makes makes the client stickier gets them the benefit of these ai and ml tools and and you know within the ecosystem it it's it's really a nice win win And when you have a feature store, you can store and fetch those transformations over and over again and track versioning and lineage. Uh, okay, so that was an awesome that was an awesome conversation. Thank you, everyone. I especially love the uh, advice about the houses and heights. I will now be looking at historic data when I buy the house in Miami for heights of stuff that have not fallen in earthquakes. So I appreciate that that pro tip. Looking out for us. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. We can still stick around and uh, do some more mingling. We are out of pizza, though, so I'm sorry. People ate it before, uh, but you guys can hang out, and we I believe we have the space till 9, so hang out and get to know each other. And, yeah, thank you so much, and hopefully we'll see you back here on November 29th for our big event. And I think we might have another meetup, so I will let you know. All right? Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. He's such a great moderator. It's amazing. Yeah.